Hello, good morning. Today, our guest is Professor Paul Seabright. Paul Seabright is a distinguished academic, and we're going to be talking about his works on gender, and I might ask a few questions about evolution. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? Hi, good morning. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show, Paul. So, Paul, we're going to talk about networks. You have been researching networks for over 10 years. What is a network, Paul? Well, we're used to the idea that people are influenced by those who surround them. So, you know, if you live in a country with uh, people that have certain characteristics, then that has an influence on you. When we talk about networks, we refer to the fact that you don't have the same strength of influence from every person that surrounds you, but some people influence you more than others. And so your network is basically the set of people who influence you more than uh, most. And obviously that's a matter that's not all or nothing matter. You can have stronger links to some people, weaker links to other people. But the idea is that not everybody who surrounds you influences you to the same extent. And the network is the set of people who influence you the most. Paul, you published a new paper titled The Old Boy Network. Are the professional networks of female executives less effective than men's for advancing their careers? Do networks provide professional benefits? They do, but it's difficult to estimate exactly how important they are. And the reason for that is that we see a very strong correlation between people who have large and extensive networks and people who prosper professionally, uh, people who have good salaries, who have good career progression and so on. But what we don't know is how much the networks are responsible for their prospering professionally and how much the networks and the fact that they prosper professionally are both of them the joint effects of some other cause. So for example, maybe it's just some people are more dynamic or more talented. And as a result of being more dynamic and more talented, they have larger or more influential networks and they prosper professionally, even if it's not the networks that are causing them to prosper professionally. So the answer is we have a hunch that networks matter, but we don't know how much they matter. And that's why research on that subject is needed, but it's difficult to do. Paul, do men have stronger networks than women? Um, it depends what you mean by stronger. They um, probably have larger networks on average than women, but it depends um, which kinds of men and which kinds of women. It's certainly true that there's a huge range of uh, size and strength of network among men and a huge range of size and strength of network among women. And if we are talking about differences between men and women, we absolutely don't mean between all men and all women. We mean on average, there's some evidence that men may have larger networks than women. And in particular though, that they have networks which consist of what the sociologist Mark Granovetter called more weak ties than strong ties. So Mark Granovetta drew a distinction between weak ties, who are your sort of acquaintances, and strong ties, who are your close friends. And Granovetta pointed to something rather paradoxical, which was that in his work, which was conducted uh, many years ago in the 1970s, he showed that if people in your network are likely to help you uh, increase the chance of getting a good job, you might think it was your strong links, the people who are close, your close friends and so on, who would be more likely to get you a job because they care more about you. So they'll put more effort into helping you. And what Granovetter showed was that in fact, it isn't your close friends, it's your distant acquaintances. And the reason for that is that your distant acquaintances are more likely to know things and know about opportunities that you don't already know. They're not so interested in helping you, but the people who do care about helping you, your close friends, your strong ties, as Granovetta called them, already know many of the things that you know, and so they're less likely to give you new information. So the conjecture is, and there's 
some good evidence for this, but it's not absolutely conclusive. The conjecture is that men may have networks with rather more weak ties in them and rather fewer strong ties in them. And that means that paradoxically, men may find it easier to get news of new opportunities, professional opportunities than women do. But again, let me emphasize, we're just talking about small differences on average between men and women. And there's a huge range of differences between men and differences between women. According to academics like David Gary, men are more work focused than women. Women, however, are more sociable than men, yet men are more likely to network. So are these effects driven by the greater desire of men for social status? Well, um, it, it depends on the, uh, what you mean by being more work focused than, than women. Many, so, so for example, uh, men are more likely to read business publications. That's one proxy to indicate that one is work focused. And, and as I said earlier, studies show that women, they're more sociable than men. They speak to people. It's easy to have a conversation with women. Men are more distant, yet they have these deeper networks. I'm wondering if men have deeper networks because they're more interested in climbing the corporate ladder. Okay, well, look, let's let's try and be clear. Are we talking about averages over all men and all women, or are we talking about averages within the world of uh, executives? Now, the paper I published was about executives, and it has to be emphasized that um, executive men are not typical of all men, and executive women are not typical of all women. So... Differences between executive men and executive women may not be the same kind of differences as you would get between men on average and women on average. I have no statistics about who reads business publications, but it wouldn't surprise me if men read them more. But remember that many women who work in um, uh, senior executive positions are a very unusual minority of women, just like the men who work in senior executive positions are a very unusual minority of men. So comparing those two groups may be a very different exercise than comparing men on average with women on average. What we do see in many large corporations is an enormous focus on uh, work in the sense of working for long hours, often at the expense of people's family time and uh, it's quite possible that on average in the population, men may be uh, more interested in succeeding through uh, corporate advancement than women are on average. But female executives, female senior executives, as I say, are a very unusual minority of women overall. And many of them are extremely focused on work. So you have to be very careful not to draw conclusions that are um, based on, uh, for example, average statistics in the population and apply them within a group like executives. All right. So there is a big difference then between female executives who climb the corporate ladder and those who opt out of the, the labor force. Because again, studies have also shown that Equally brilliant women who do academically well in school, they're professionally connected. After getting married, they there is an exodus of those women outside of the labor force. And you're saying that women who climb the corporate ladder at, to, at the, to the highest level are quite different from the usual woman. Well, one of the things we see, and there's a, a, a very fine study uh, conducted on the graduates of a major business school in the United States. It followed the male and female graduates of this business school. It was an MBA program. And it looked at what had happened to their careers five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years afterwards. And what it found was that um, men and women started out having very little difference in their career progression, but that, um, Taking time out to have children was bad for the careers of everybody, both the men and the women. 
But more women than men took time out from their careers to have children. Now, we have no idea, just based on those findings, whether the women who decided to take out time from their careers to have children were less career motivated, or whether it just was that they had partners whom they could count on less. Uh, it may be that the women would have liked to succeed in their careers just as much as the men would, but that their opportunities were different. So it's very hard to um, conclude from what we see about career progression, whether the differences which clearly are there between men's and women's career trajectories are to do with different preferences or whether it's to do with different opportunities. It may be a bit of both, but we very clearly see that taking time out to have children, uh, that's to say taking time away from your job to have children, slows down the career progression of everybody. But more women do that than men do that. So more women are slowed down in their career than men are slowed down. Professor, Professor Seabright, are people more likely to be helped by their own gender? Uh, once again, it depends on the study you look at, but it seems likely that men are more likely to give help to other men and women are more likely to give help to other women. And of course, that means that in circles where there are more men in senior positions, men may have an easier time of getting helped by senior people in their profession than women who will get help uh, to some extent from senior people everywhere, but will get more help from women. If there are fewer women around to give that help, then it's a disadvantage for women. That's certainly true. And it's what we find in the study that I've done with Marie Lalanne, to which you kindly referred. Yes. And in the abstract, you, both of you note, second, a, sub, a subset of employers we identify as female-friendly firms recruit more women but reward networks less than other firms. What's going on here? Okay, so what's going on here, and I should stress that this is suggestive evidence, it's not absolutely conclusive, but what we find is uh, that it's likely that firms differ in the extent to which they use broadly professional techniques to recruit. So if you think about a caricature of a very old fashioned firm, which when it decided it was going to look for new members of the board or new people in senior positions, would ask their senior executives to um, listen out at the golf club or uh, see if any of their friends could recommend good people. Now, that doesn't happen very much anymore, but clearly some uh, firms will be relying on informal networks more than other firms. At the other extreme, you have firms that use very, very professional methods. They use headhunters, they use quantitative analysis, they do search using all uh, kinds of sophisticated quantitative uh, techniques. And what we see is that the firms that use more sophisticated methods tend to reward networks less. And that's natural because the fact that they're using more sophisticated techniques, they're doing big internet-based searches, they're um, using quantitative assessment of people's profiles, they're starting with a very much larger pool of potential candidates. Therefore, they don't see the need to rely on personal contacts, word of mouth, and so on. So that means that the candidates who have greater networks of contacts don't get so much benefit from those networks when being recruited by those kinds of firms. Now, it happens that those kinds of firms also are more likely to recruit women. That's normal because the old fashioned ways of recruiting women tended to keep talented women out of senior positions. So if you're a business that's using more sophisticated, more quantitative, more informationally rich methods of recruitment, you're less likely to reward networks and you're more likely to find and recruit talented women. So it's a paradox. Women are actually better off being recruited by those firms, but 
women with strong and extensive networks are not much more better off than women who don't have strong and extensive networks. Professor Seabright, I read one of your older papers also on the, the matter of gender quotas and the pay gap. And this paper is titled The Old Boys Network, Gender Differences in the Impact of Social Networks on Remuneration in Top Executive Jobs. It was published in 2011, but still quite germane. And, and in this paper, you discuss the differences in remuneration between non-executive executive board members and executive board members, but you also note that men were at the time were better able to leverage their networks. Yes, that was an early version of the published yeah. paper to which you kindly referred. And the published version contains what we believe and what the journal editors believe were the most robust findings of the earlier version, which was a working paper. So I would not now yeah. put all of that much weight on the findings of the early paper that were, did not make it into the final published paper. So I think that's not something that I would put much weight on now. Okay. But I, I also I read the papers and I, I just found this paper to be quite interesting because the glass stealing still persists. There's still a gender pay gap and there's still a gap at the c suit level. Do you know mm -hmm. why this persistence has been so enduring? Well, um, you referred uh, earlier to um, a number of suggestions, including that um, it might be that some men in senior positions were very much more focused on success at work than in other domains. And I think there probably is something in this. I mean, I say this as somebody who has no interest at all in uh, succeeding in becoming a corporate executive at the very top level. For me, that is not a, a life that I would like. It's not, uh, it doesn't correspond to my values and my uh, choice of um, things on which to focus my time and my energies. I've always appreciated having a decent work-life balance, and uh, I've spent. I've been very fortunate to have a, a job in which I could spend time with my children as they were growing up. And I would not have liked the requirement to spend so much time in uh, an office uh, that I could not see my children. And so. My view is that if it is true, and there's some evidence that it may be, that many senior women are not attracted to the um, particular conditions that they have to work in in order to succeed in the very top and most demanding executive positions, I would say good for them. That's a sign of um, excellent judgment. So it is quite likely that um, working in very top executive positions imposes demands on people that many senior women quite reasonably decide they don't wish to meet um, and that more men do. And I think that's unfortunate that for, for those men, as well as for the companies they run, that uh, they are required to display those characteristics. I also think that some um, large uh, business environments unreasonably prioritize things like being available 24 seven for clients, um, being prepared to jump on a long haul uh, flight um, uh, at a weekend uh, in order to do a deal on the other side of the world. Because it's not clear to me that um, working in this high pressure environment and uh, trying to do deals at very short notice necessarily leads to better strategic decisions in the long run. So I think there's evidence that a lot of the intense high pressure decision making that takes place in uh, senior corporate environments is not actually good for the performance of the businesses concerned, but it may be more attractive to senior males than to senior females. So I think one of the sources of the difference has to do with that. In a different way, further down the corporate ladder, 
there may be jobs which are more flexible and therefore suit the fact that more women re require and request flexible working uh, conditions than men do. Um, and that may be a reason for the persistence of the fact that those flexible jobs pay rather less, uh, but are more sought after by women. Now, that doesn't mean that women necessarily intrinsically prefer flexible jobs. It may be, as I said earlier, that their domestic circumstances constrain them more. Maybe they just are not lucky enough to work with partners who uh, can enable themselves, enable them to devote themselves uh, to the work as much as many men do. In fact, um, a, a friend and, and former colleague of mine called Terry Apta wrote uh, a book with a wonderful title, which is that working women don't have wives. And what she implied was that many men working in demanding corporate environments are lucky to have partners who uh, make it possible for them to dedicate themselves to the job with an intensity that many women working in those environments uh, are not able to allow themselves. So the explanations are complicated. Um, what there is much less evidence of, I think, is direct discrimination within job titles. So whereas 20 years ago, it was very common that two people, one male and one female, working in the same job might have uh, very different salaries. And we've seen some very striking examples of that recently in the BBC, for example, where the BBC's China editor, uh, Carrie Gracie, resigned on discovering that other male editors in the same position as her were being paid much more. And she uh, sued the BBC, the BBC settled and uh, she won her case. And so we see a number of cases of discrimination like this within the same category of job, but I think that's disappearing. Within the same category of job, there's much less discrimination than there used to be. But what remains, and this is the main explanation for the overall differences in, uh, in pay between men and women, is different proportions of men and women in different job categories. And there, the real difficult thing is to know whether men and women are sorting into different jobs because they have different preferences, or whether they're being subtly steered into different jobs uh, by um, the fact that they don't have the same kinds of network opportunities and that those networks don't help them to the same extent. That remains a very open question, and it's quite clear that there are big differences in salaries and wages overall in the economy between men and women, but the extent to which that's because of men and women sorting uh, through their preferences for different kinds of work and to what extent it's to do with things like the influence of their networks still remains a very open question for research. Brilliant summation. Professor C Seabright, are you going to write a book uh, and, and teaching entrepreneurs how to make the workplace more productive? That's a great idea. I don't have the project as yet, but I have often thought that uh, I would like to write something about making work and human life more compatible with each other. Um, the difficulty I think is that different workplaces do this to different extents. And um, nowadays we have to try and mix family, friends, um, work, and also a range of other commitments, like how can we be good citizens? And so what I've often thought is that I'd like to write a book about how private people can inhabit public spaces without becoming psychologically conflicted. If you can think of a good title for that book, I might propose it to a publisher. So yeah. thanks for suggesting. Yes, I, I've been following the debate on worker productivity, and it appears that happy workers are productive workers and respectful environments induce pr greater levels of productivity. So if you want your workers to produce output at the highest level, it's best to facilitate a collaborative environment. I think that's in general true, but 
there are some hard choices we still sometimes have to make. I mean, anybody who has um, had to deal with young children knows that when you have young children, you often neglect your other uh, duties and your other commitments. And most of the time, those of us with young children are happy to do that. But as our children grow up and as we come to have other commitments, we all face difficult choices. And I don't think we can get anywhere by pretending that difficult choices can be made to go away. So, you know, for example, um, are you going to spend more time with your um, adolescent children, um, talking to them and um, helping them discover life? Or are you going to spend more time as a committee, uh, as a local community organizer, for example, for a political party? Those are both um, admirable things to do. But as anybody who tries to do both of those things can tell you, they do raise difficult choices. You can't commit yourself to everything to the fullest extent. And making those difficult choices is something that um, there are no simple solutions for and that we all have to work our way through. But I think giving good advice to people about how to manage those choices better and how to ensure that we don't hurt other people when we do them, uh, that's something that we can learn a lot from each other uh, about. Professor Seabright, I am interested in the dynamics of networks, and I've read papers asserting that family networks matter and grandparents matter. Paul, do you have... Sorry, can you say that again, that what networks matter? Family networks and grand family networks. Yes, and grandparents also matter. Paul, do you have grandchildren? Uh, no, not yet. Anyway. Oh, but do you have children? I have three adult children. Yes. Oh, three adult children. Yes, that's a problem these days. Children are having their children at a later age. So yes. people who become grandparents are quite old. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. I sometimes, I, I, I. I sometimes think that um, I would, I'm very glad to have had uh, uh, children when I was old enough to, um, to, to look after them properly, but I wish I had had them when they were young enough that I could be uh, vigorous and energetic enough to look after grandchildren when they eventually come. So um, you're exactly right. There's a paradox there that, We'd all like to have um, children when we're a bit older and grandchildren when we're a bit younger than um, life actually offers us. Um, but there you go. That's just an example of what I said, that life sometimes gives us tough choices which we can't escape. Exactly, because a lot of older academics, they're in their 70s, 80s, approaching 90, they're energetic people and they still work. And sometimes I wonder, if they had younger grandchildren, would they be working as much? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> a, <that's laughs> yes, like even some of these point. driven CEOs who are pretty old, they don't have grandkids or they have grandchildren who are really, really, really young. So there's no incentive to stay home and go to the beach with grandchildren. Yeah. Well, the other thing, of course, that uh, I'm sure you, you've thought about is that uh, um, around the world a lot more, um, the probability that they will live very close to their grandchildren has declined. Um, I mean, my children, my adult children, until very recently, lived a very long distance away from me. I had a son in California, I had a son in Germany, and I had a daughter in the UK. Now, Fortunately, they're starting to move a little closer. My son from California has now moved not to the same country, but he now lives about two hours plane flight away instead of 15 hours plane flight away. And my daughter, who was living in the UK, has moved back to France. So you can move closer together. But I do think that as a feature of modern life, the ability of people of my age, so over 60, uh, to rely on having grandchildren nearby uh, has become rarer and rarer. And that is obviously a bit of a shame. Um, there are good things that come from having um, children being free to move away to find their fulfillment, to find their happiness, to find love, to find work, to find um, uh, all kinds of fulfillment. But 
that takes them away from the place where their own parents live. And that means that when they have children in turn, um, it's harder for the grandparents and the grandchildren to forge the same kind of ties. But again, you know, there are things you can do about that. And finding ways for older generation and younger generation to speak to each other is very important. I mean, you um, talked about the fact that senior executives, very senior executives, often uh, would be better off if they could have grandchildren uh, encouraging them, them to spend more time at home and less time in the office. But equally, I think that when you look at the very elderly, so my parents are, are now in their 90s, um, for them, being able to talk to their grandchildren and increasingly their great-grandchildren is a, a, an extraordinary um, source of joy for them in what is otherwise a very difficult period of their lives. And so I think that as we get more and more old people in our societies, but our young people are dispersing, we need to find ways of reconnecting the old people in our societies to their children and great grandchildren in order to make their old age a, a bearable condition. Exactly. I read a recent article published by The Economist magazine lamenting the effects of population decline and an aging population. So an aging population will expose us to new innovations. We're going to focus on innovations that benefit elderly people. But when people become old and isolated, that's when we begin to truly worry about cultural decline. So there are arguments about saving dying languages and dying customs. But if you're not connecting with the people who are preserving these customs, what's the point? Absolutely. And in fact, one of the things that I, I realized is, as my parents have been getting older is that they remember details about their early lives. And my, my parents were both born shortly before the Second World War. And they lived through the war and they have large and, and vital memories about that, which uh, it's increasingly harder and harder to, I mean, many of those memories they've, they've now forgotten. And I wish that when I was younger, I had been more energetic in recording what they remembered because now that's lost. So yes, the, the point you make is absolutely crucial. And grandparents, also provide beneficial networks because as an academic you have much to teach your grandchildren but if you have grandchildren in your 80s and then your 90s and they live in different countries your ability to impart knowledge becomes diminished quite considerably so from a network standpoint grandparents are also crucial Yes, uh, you make a very good point. And I would add something else too, which is that the older you are when you have grandchildren, the harder it is for you to keep up with the kinds of um, technological change which affect their lives. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. When, um, when I uh, was approaching adulthood and was going to leave home and travel by myself for the, the first time, my my uh, parents gave me various bits of advice, which um, seemed sensible enough to me at the time, but this was before the age of the internet. And I didn't know what, uh, I, I had no way to balance their advice with information of my own. By the time my own children came to be adults, they were very internet savvy. They knew how to navigate. They knew how to get information. And I think, therefore, that um, we had much more fruitful discussions. I mean, to take an example about how do you travel alone in countries that you're not familiar with without running the risk of being uh, robbed, attacked, um, uh, generally treated badly. And the fact that they were able to use the internet to get in touch with networks of other travelers meant that they and I could have very fruitful conversations about the advice that I could give them, but which they could match with and complement with information that they themselves got on the internet. And what I slightly worry about is that if I am very elderly by the time I have grandchildren, then by the time they're old enough for me to be able to impart um, really good experience from my own life, 
I will be too old to be very coherent and the world <laughs> they inhabit will be too different from the world I know for me to be able to understand what are their preoccupations and their concerns. Exactly. So it, it would be really unfortunate if, let's say, you were to become a grandparent in your 80s or late 70s and then die a few years later and people, your grandchildren, would only be told, your grandfather, Paul Siebert, was this famous academic. Well, uh, you can talk to my children about that. I, I feel that uh, I, I, um, I have to be very tactful, but maybe you should get in touch with them and tell yeah. them yeah, that Paul, they read up. Yeah, Paul Siebert was this famous, was this big deal academia. And you're like, well, I, I don't know him. <laughs> yeah. That would be really an unfortunate. But speaking, speaking to you, Paul, has been a pleasure, and I would love to have you on again. Bye. Thank you very much, then. Yes. Bye.